カナダの人権弁護士として活躍するデイビッド・マタス氏中国臓器狩りや中国の移植犯罪国家による臓器狩りを執筆し中国共産党による生態臓器摘出にフォーカスしてきました韓中国の記者が東京でマタス氏に独占インタビューすることができました so, first, could you make an introduction about how did you find the evidence of organ harvest happening in China? It was a matter of piecing together a different evidentiary strand. Uh, the way we started was just to determine whether this is ha happening, not that it is happening. And in order to determine whether it was happening, we had to look at uh, evidence of proof and evidence of disproof. And what we found in terms of evidence of disproof there basically wasn't anything in terms of evidence of proof. There was a lot. Uh, for instance, we could look at the laws. Uh, we could see the Chinese laws. This 1979 law allowed for the sourcing of organs of persons without their consent if their bodies were unclaimed. Used, uh, if the organs were used for research or education purposes. We saw 1984 law said that the organs can be sourced from prisoners without their consent uh, if their bodies were unclaimed. The, uh, we saw internationally there was nothing uh, to prevent transplant tourism, uh, that if you killed somebody locally for an organ, you could be prosecuted. But if you went to China and was involved in killing somebody for their organs, you wouldn't be prosecuted in China, you wouldn't be prosecuted when you got home. So that there was the, the, the whole legal issue. In terms of ethics, there was also nothing. There, there was uh, uh, something about consent, but that was about the detail of it, that uh, you had to consent to medical procedures. Uh, but as I indicated, in China, there was these two laws that said the bodies of claim, no consent necessary. The, um, but in terms of doctor-patient relationships, in terms of uh, publications, in terms of research, in, in terms of education, in terms of training, it's just a total ethical pattern in China, China and uh, internationally. In terms of international legal instruments, again, nothing. There is the uh, Convention on uh, Transnational Crime, the Protocol on uh, Trafficking, uh, but uh, if you had an officer of drugs and crime said that the, that protocol didn't include uh, trafficking in uh, human organs. And uh, so it, it, there was that evidentiary strand. Uh, there was a huge volume of transplants with no obvious source of other explanation besides uh, prisoners' conscience. The uh, Chinese didn't have a donation system. Uh, you, you, uh, there was a cultural aversion to donation. Uh, the, the Chinese at one point said it was death penalty prisoners, but the, the, the death penalty had to be executed within seven days of sentence. There was a lot of hepatitis B in the prisons, uh, and, the, and the death penalty was going down. Uh, so that, that wasn't an uh, obvious uh, explanation. There was the blood testing and organ examination of, uh, of uh, Hong Kong practitioners in uh, detention. It wasn't for their health because they were being tortured to can, uh, but it's necessary for transplants because you need blood type compatibility, uh, ideally uh, size compatibility, uh, tissue type compatibility. So uh, th there was that. And there was uh, phone calls of investigators uh, into uh, hospitals uh, asking uh, for Organs of Palangal on the basis uh, was uh, they, they pretended to be relatives of patients who needed organs, and the, these uh, patients and their relatives asked pretended to be asking for Palangal because uh, uh, Palangal is a set of exercises, it's good for their health, and so the organs would be healthy. And uh, you know, there, there is admissions here in China transcribed, translated, tra uh, and uh, posted. Uh, recorded, uh, so, so so there was that. And so what we had is all of these various evidentiary strands, and there was others besides, and we put them all together, and that's how we came to the conclusion. 
section. So, since you reported the evidence of, of organ harvest happening in China, did the Chinese Communist Party ask you to stop such activity? Well, it, I mean, I'm not in direct communication with the Communist Party of China. Uh, they, they have issued uh, reactions, uh, but the reactions were uh, to, um, they said I'm anti-China, which obviously is not the case, because if I really were anti-China, I would, would really care if some Chinese were killing other Chinese. Uh, the, uh, they said that uh, my work was based on rumor, but it wasn't because everything we did is independently verifiable and most of the information comes from uh, official Chinese sources. Uh, for instance, they had, the, 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 the Chinese hospitals used to advertise press lists, they, they used to advertise in short waiting times, uh, the liver transplant registry in Hong Kong, which official government registry for a big boom, uh, a big rise in transplants uh, after the Peloton detention. So, I mean, a lot of our uh, evidence came from official Chinese sources, and none of it came from, you know, somebody told me this, somebody mm -hmm. told me that. Uh, nothing was wrong. That definitely not a strong rule. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, uh, many clear evidence. Uh, really exactly, true. exactly. The, 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 there was clear evidence. I, I did get a couple of threatening uh, incidents, uh, a, both from Australia and what, what, both in Queensland, one from uh, near Brisbane, one was at Brisbane. One time uh, I, I was doing a meeting in a, a community center uh, in the coast and uh, the, there were people calling in from China and uh, it was set up so that people could listen and call it through the internet. So one of the people called it through the internet and said, I'm from the internet police, so what you're doing is putting your life at uh, risk. Are you not afraid? I mean, that was the question. My answer was, uh, if you don't like what I'm saying about forced organ harvesting in China, try to stop forced organ harvesting in China and don't threaten me. That was the end of the call. Another time, uh, this was in, in Brisbane, there was a, the Epoch Times was hosting an event where I was speaking. I think the day before uh, there was a drive-by shooting at the premises, bullet holes in the window. Mm -hmm. They chased after the car. They could see it was uh, the license number was blocked. It was a black car. There was a Chinese inside, but the, the, that was the only evidence. Uh, but uh, and I have had a number of events that have been cancelled at the last minute uh, around the world. Uh, it, yeah, and the typically. Uh, when there is cancellations, the, the, the people who cancel don't say it's because the Chinese got fast. But uh, I've also been to a number of events where the hosts have been have, have been asked to cancel. They didn't, and, and they tell me that they've been approached by the Chinese government. So I, I guess the, the, what the Chinese government has been doing is not so much asking me to stop as asking other people, you know, not. Uh, not to give me a platform or not to uh, uh, allow me to speak. Uh, so th there has been, I would say, an active effort to shut me down, but uh, not direct personally at me, but direct to people who might reproduce what I'm saying. That's I, I, I wonder, so what is the origin of your courage to uh, do such an activity? Uh, well, a number of different things. First of all, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm Jewish, and uh, I, I, my first involvement in human rights was to the Holocaust, uh, which, uh, I mean, I was born during the Holocaust, so uh, I was well aware that uh, back in the babies of war, neither I nor one Jewish person would be alive today. And so uh, I, I was constantly dealing with it. it uh, my uh, attitude, I mean, the uh, Holocaust was over by the time I was an adult, and, uh, and uh, there's nothing I, I couldn't have done to stop it, but what I could could have done, try to do, is learn the lessons from the Holocaust, uh, act on them, uh, use those lessons as a legacy, uh, to give some sort of meaning to uh, what's uh, otherwise meaningless death of so many people and uh, total innocence. And, and I, I 
realized that what we're dealing with here, I mean, of course, each, each mass atrocity has its own particularities, and that's certainly true of the Holocaust, but we're dealing here to a certain extent with uh, the human condition, with human nature, with the capacity of everyone uh, to do good or inflict evil. Uh, and uh, so, and, and, and what I've seen, I mean, I've become involved in human rights, uh, trying to act on lessons of Holocaust. Now, what I see is one human rights violation after another. So once some disappear and others pop up, I mean, the, the victimization of Don Gong didn't begin from 1999, which is long, 50 years after the Holocaust, uh, more than 50 years. And, 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 and that's been my experience. I work on one human rights violation that goes away, and that's wonderful, but then another violation appears, and I realize over the course of time that what we're dealing with is an exercise in mitigation, that we can eradicate human violations because we can't change the human personality. I mean, we can change the technology, but we can't change the human condition. So that, uh, what we have is constantly to combat the, the, these uh, new uh, the depravities, which it, 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 in some ways over time get worse simply because technology advances and, and, and the power to inflict uh, mass atrocities uh, just becomes more widespread and, and also new technology is, is typically better for human good and the people who invent it don't anticipate the harms and therefore the precautions are in place to prevent them from happening and we only find out about the, the ways they can be abused after the abuse happens so we're constantly caught on cash from trying to prevent remedy after we see abuses that we didn't anticipate for from technology 